This is episode number 69, featuring one of America's great landscape painters, a man you need to get to know, John Cosby. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast from Plein Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we dig into the world of outdoor painting called Plein Air Painting. For those of you who don't know, it's a French term essentially meaning the open air or outdoors. The French say Plein Air, others say Plein Air, but it doesn't matter how you say it really. It's just a huge movement of artists around the world going outdoors to paint. I call it the new golf, and this show is about that movement. The podcast is brought to you by Plein Air Magazine's Publishers Invitational. Yep, that's me. I'm the publisher, and you're invited. It's summer camp for artists in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York. I was talking to artist Lori McNee this morning, and she said, I can't even say it. Adirondacks? Anyway, it's a beautiful place, one of the best kept secrets in America. It's in the upstate New York area near the Canadian border. The mountains are fabulous. They're kind of like the Rocky Mountains. They're just spectacular and beautiful, beautiful painting. Come for a week of painting and leave with a collection of about 15 or more paintings of the most stunning paintings and scenery that you've done. Um, You'll make lots of new friends, paint with some incredible painters and have some great memories. Usually a lot of well-known artists show up, and though everybody's equal at this event, it's kind of nice to be able to set up next to somebody who's pretty well-known. I know John McDonald, who's coming, uh, Eric Koppel and Lauren Sansarik are coming, um, Rick Wilson, and probably some others. Anyway, all levels are invited. Don't be intimidated. It's beginners to pros. We all paint and hang out together for a week. You might be painting next to somebody famous, or you might just be hanging out with some, some other friends. We're all equals at this event, and there is... No invitation required, even though I call it an invitational. Probably not the best name in the world. All the meals and rooms are included. It's just roll out of bed and paint two, three, four paintings a day every day. We sit up at night. We play music. We do uh, portraits some nights. Uh, We go canoeing. You know, we do all kinds of things. Campfires. It's a lot of fun. You can learn more at publishersinvitational.com. And that's coming up in June. So usually that thing sells out. You want to get those tickets soon go to publishersinvitational.com. You know, it's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting, and you can help by sharing this podcast with your friends on social media or email. And I hope you'll subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And, of course, if you have feedback or requests, you can email me, eric, at plenairmagazine.com. Well, we're getting close. We're getting very close Uh, The Plein Air Convention is coming up April 16th through 20th in Santa Fe. This is the biggest and most uh, embraced we've ever had. Thank you for all of you who are coming. Those of you who are not yet coming, uh, as of the time I'm recording this, there are some seats left. I hope there will be some for you. We now have at least 83 top artists there to teach with you, to work with you in the field. You don't need to be intimidated. Everybody comes, whether you've ever painted or you're not very good at painting. We're just one big giant family. This is like Plein Air Mecca, a chance to become part of that community of Plein Air painters. Last year, uh, close to 1,000 people came, and this year we're way ahead. So who knows what we're going to end up with. But this is a magnificent hotel, Buffalo Thunder. Uh, We're going out to some incredible places to paint, including where Georgia O'Keeffe painted in, in Ghost Ranch. And we have uh, some unbelievable, iconic Santa Fe sites. You're not going to want to miss it. We are also doing something new this year. We're going to do an art walk on Canyon Road where all of us are going to be there together going through all the galleries. It's going to be a lot of fun. So you don't want to miss this year. It's a very special one. We're painting outdoors together daily, but we're also getting instruction indoors daily. And we've got four stages, got lots of stuff going on at all times. You can learn more at Plein Air Convention. Dot com. Well, let's get right to our interview with the amazing John Cosby. I'm honored to have John Cosby on with me. John is one of the premier painters, one of the great plein air painters, and of course, great studio painters of all time. I think he's going to go down in history as one of the great painters of all time. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, 
let's start at the very beginning because you and I know a little bit about one another because we did a video together um, and we've done another interview at another time. We've hung out a little bit. So how did this whole painting thing begin for you? Well, it has a few different uh, times that it changed, but uh, in the beginning, my grandmother was a painter. So I was exposed to painting very early in my life. She babysat me three or four days after school. And since she was painting all the time and studying with some of the early California painters down here in Laguna Beach, um, I got exposed. I had no idea what a, a treasure trove of information I was getting and just kind of, uh, you know, worked on my paintings along the line that any child does. I enjoyed uh, moving paint around and drawing things. And then um, I went on some other adventures and had other things happen in my life uh, during my late teens and early 20s, but I always drew. And uh, eventually uh, I was on a sailing, a cruising uh, sailing down the East Coast and uh, as part of the adventure I was talking about. And I, I didn't have a way to make money. And uh, But I would draw other people's boats while we were in port and so I ended up uh, starting to raise by or, or trade for meals or rope or a lamp. And I realized there was a commercial value in, in drawing and painting. And uh, I just kind of continued along that line until I became a commercial illustrator. And uh, I worked with In-N-Out Burger and uh, a lot of other Bosch and Lom and Ray-Ban. And I did independent illustration for magazine covers and their ads. And one day, the owner of In-N-Out Burger walked into my studio. I was in my late 20s to look at a project, and um, he, he looked around and he saw my landscapes hanging on the wall in oil, or actually in acrylic at the time. And uh, he said, who does these? And I told him, and he said, I, can I buy them? And I, I just bought a new house. And I said, yeah, which one do you like? And he said, well, I'll take all of them. <laughs> and my, my life changed. <laughs> I... Uh, I was all of a sudden an easel painter. So, so he walked. He walked into. Doing that. He walked into your house because you were doing design work for him, and it was probably a pretty small company at the time. Yes, no. Well, they had about thirty-five, forty re restaurants. Oh, pretty uh, big. I was. I was doing. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty big. It's a lot bigger now, and it was just becoming a legend. The, the company. Uh, so it was, uh, I recognized the opportunity with him and I felt very fortunate to work with him. Um, uh, but boy, when he released me like that, uh, things changed. And you designed the in out burger logo, did you not? Yes, I did. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, to, to know that there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of locations with your logo all over it. That's great. Yeah, it is. It's fun to, well, still to this day, my my son uh, claims that is my claim to fame and uh, tells all his friends that more than, uh, you know, about the museums I'm in or the galleries that I show him. He goes back to that. <laughs> well, that'll change once he matures a little bit, I suppose. Mm hmm Probably so, will. So uh, what happened then once you sold these paintings to the CEO of In-N-Out Burger, what happened from that point forward? It, did it give you a kind of a new sense of confidence? Well, it did, but uh, this was in the 80s and it was uh, challenging to uh, find any outlet for that type of art, for representational art in Newport Beach, California, where I was. Uh, so I had a retail background because that's what my parents did my whole life. And I just opened a gallery because nobody else would take my work. And uh, it made... Uh, uh, it made my uh, name go up in lights, you know, on the sign in the front window. And uh, I looked important. And uh, at the time, nobody else was really representing paintings like mine in the area. I was painting boats because that's what I had been doing, you know, a lot in my easel painting. And uh, paintings started selling. So eventually I decided the gallery business wasn't the best thing for an artist to be in. Uh, because you become a slave to your rent and paint paintings for the wrong reasons. So I quit that and uh, galleries started picking me up all over the United States because I was a proven seller, I guess. Cool. So now you had a you talk about your brief stint as an illustrator. 
Well, uh, illustration, of course, you become the hands uh, for a bigger brain, you know, the, the group of the company. And uh, what I learned out of illustration was the discipline and the exacting um, uh, specifications for making an image work. And I think a lot of painters that I know, uh, came from, uh, really successful painters, came from illustration backgrounds because of that. They know how to work. They know how to stay on the job. They know how to get things done. They can actually show up for their show and have paintings on the wall that are complete and framed and ready to go. Um, so uh, when he released me from illustration, I certainly was enjoying myself illustrating. But um, to be able to paint the reasons that I wanted to paint, uh, every day and different subjects and travel was, uh, you know, a secret uh, love of mine anyway. So uh, I had traveled quite a bit before that. And uh, I got back to it and started traveling the world with a, I didn't have a, really have much of a studio. I had a living room. So I painted mostly outdoors. I didn't know that there was a such thing as plein air painting. I'd never heard it. But um, that's what I was. And so... Uh, remarkably, we find a lot of people who have had remarkable careers who started out as illustrators, but there has to be um, a moment when you realize that you have to you, you have to do things differently. How would you define what you do differently in an illustration environment versus a painting environment? Well, an illustration is certainly a commercial endeavor. You have to... Uh, paint what people want you to paint and you have to paint it with, uh, uh, you know, a lot of specifics in mind, like where it's going and, and the, uh, amount the budget is how much time you're given. There's a lot of constraints. Whereas <clears throat> the other is true with fine art. Uh, you have almost no constraints cause there's almost no expectations on you for an individual painting. It's, it's kind of secret until you, release it to the world. So a lot of discipline has to pay, play in because you don't have a 24 hour deadline or a 48 hour deadline. You have the rest of your life to do a painting. So you can nitpick it to death or you can ignore it for a while, or you can get right on it and try to work through it. Um, you have to have a lot of self-discipline and get up in the morning and, and be truly engaged by what you're working on. So what's so a what's a, a typical a day? What's a typical day for for you like? Well, usually I get up every day excited about what I learned yesterday. Um, I, I, I I've been working on something in a painting, and it seems like towards the end of the day, my wife has to call me a lot and remind me to come home because I'm getting more and more engaged in the painting as I go along. So. When I wake up the next day, I kind of continue that thought process. And I just get up in the morning and make a big cup of uh, pot of coffee. I used to be a cup. Now I drink a pot. And uh, come into, I have a really large studio, a big warehouse that I was a tire shop. And I, it's got a big rolling door, and I just love it in here. And uh, I come in and just tackle the project. that uh, Usually I go straight to painting because I'm fresh. And uh, I often go outdoors also and do my studies and get them ready for, for what I'm going to do in the studio. And uh, then in the, uh, I take a day or two a week to do the infrastructure work of an artist's career, the, the interactions, the emails, uh, you know, bookkeeping, things like that. Yeah. So uh, maybe you can articulate for people who might have the dream of doing what you're doing for a living why those things are important too. And because, you know, the tendency for most of us who are artists is we really don't want to do that stuff, but that's really essential, isn't it? Well, actually I've found that you can bring art to it. It's uh, if you embrace it, if you, if you, if you deny it or try to get somebody else to do it all for you, you don't know your business as well. You don't interact with people who are important to your business and therefore, you lose contact with the world around you, and you don't really control your career. You may control your easel or your paint, but you don't control things outside of that. And that becomes really important in the long term. If you're going to do this for 25, 30, 40 years, you have to have your uh, finger on the pulse of what's actually happening to your uh, career. 
it's hard enough that the galleries, um, uh, as a, for instance, uh, one source I use to sell my work is galleries, and they don't really interact with you on a regular basis and tell you what people are saying about your work. So I try to find out ways uh, that I'm getting, I try to get feedback on work. I think that's uh, really important. So you, you used a word mm-hmm. that some people cringe at, um, business, business. Um, <laughs> because I run into a lot of artists who say, listen, I, 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 I paint, I want to make my living as a painter, but I don't consider myself a business person or a marketer. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, there are a lot of different personalities out there, and, and some people uh, embrace uh, businesses, uh, the business approach to something uh, in a very rigid way. And uh, some people are more open to, like I, I feel I am, I'm, I'm, I handle it rather I guess you'd say, I hate to use the word loosely, but uh, I, I hold on to it and I know what's going on in my world, but I don't put a lot of stock in uh, controlling every aspect of it. Right. I feel like life kind of travels along its own path. So I don't, I don't know much more to say about that without getting into details. Well, let me ask you this question about, uh, about details. If somebody has the dream of making their living as an artist, you've been doing it long enough that you've kind of figured it out. You know what works, what doesn't, you know um, how to behave. Are there any uh, two or three things perhaps that maybe would be good advice that you could pass on to people who might want to consider that? Well, uh, life, I think, uh, as soon as you monetize the painting and, and make it into something you'd like to eat from, uh, other than just a hobby, you uh, enter into the people business. Uh, you're you're going to be involved with people. So if you're going to be a hermit and be in your studio or be out in the field all the time, there's going to be a chafing against that uh, long term. And uh, people aren't going to stand on your side quite as readily. So the chafing becomes worse. So I guess... I guess the best thing I could say, the best advice I could give is, is uh, consider people an asset uh, that you deal with and treat them fairly like you'd like to be treated. Uh, don't, be, don't act desperate, even if you are. Uh, and people will respond in a way of taking care of you because uh, you are an artist. You, you've got special sensibilities that other people don't have. And that can be very unique in its own way and allow people to... Uh, I, guess, I wouldn't say coddle you, but give you special consideration. Let's talk about my favorite subject. You know what that is? I know. <laughs> Plein air painting. Okay. <laughs> you don't buy it? <laughs> that is, that's got to be d- dear to you, yes. <laughs> you know, it's pretty important to me. So yeah. um, you, you mentioned that you you oftentimes go out. How often do you go plein air painting and how often do you use studies for your paintings versus photographs? Well, I, a good half to three quarters of my paintings that uh, you would see in a gallery or online are done completely in plain air. I paint up to 30 by 40 outdoors now and I have been for a number of years. And uh, then uh, the larger works, or pieces that I feel like I can do more justice to than I captured outdoors, I bring back into the studio and I either paint a larger work from a study or I rework or finish off paintings that I've done in the field. Uh, So it's a fairly high percentage. I I find that I go stale in the studio. Um, I, and I'm also, I like being outdoors. So at least once a week uh, to twice a week, I'm out in the field. Uh, doing either color studies or full paintings, or I'm on a trip. I do uh, several trips a year where I go 10 to 12 days. I found much more than that, and your home life kind of falls apart. So I try to maintain a 10-day limit. Sometimes it has to go a little longer with travel times. And how often do you go out um, every year? uh, Well, every two uh, to three months, I'm out on a trip like that, and then I do long weekend uh, excursions 
around California or Arizona or, or uh, you know places I don't have to get on an airplane. Uh, and I just drive about and um, I'm a bicycle rider, so I spend time every day on my bicycle or at least every other day. And uh, I usually find my paintings uh, from one of those sources. I, I even, uh, I even have gotten to where I fly drone, a drone up uh, like canyons and mountains and look at things. <laughs> and then when I hike up there with my 50 pound pack, I know I'm not wasting my time. Oh, what a great idea. So that's a, that's a, yeah, a, a yeah. new tool for plein air painters. <laughs> it is. I haven't found it very useful for taking photography or reference because I don't paint that much from photography, but I found it really useful for scouting. Well, that's a great idea because how many times have we walked up to the top of a mountain and found out there was no view? Too often. And yeah. with a 50-pound pack, you, you, you regret it. The older you get, you regret it more. <laughs> well, uh, in, in terms of um, keeping the freshness in the studio, you, I guess you've painted enough outdoors that what happens outdoors continues indoors. But do you find that you tend to overdo things in the studio or over, get, get too detailed or over noodle your paintings or how do you, how do you prevent that from happening? Uh, really? That's what I mean by going stale. Um, as soon as I feel that I'm moving towards that, cause I think it is inevitable, uh, unless you're very process oriented. Some people I've met are, are so they have a specific way of painting a painting. I'm, I, I, I have methods that I use, but, I don't, uh, for instance, paint from the top of the canvas down like some of the uh, classic training can can give you. Um, so I, I tend to start tightening up a little too much or I start uh, pushing color a little bit too much. And I find by going back outside, even if I'm not painting the same painting or the same scene, I will uh, loosen up a little bit again and, and regain my footing. Do you ever take uh, bring my color back? Do you ever take the big studio piece outside and, and um, uh, to the same location you did the study? Well, considering that I paint up to 30 by 40 outdoors anyway, uh, I go up to about that. And not very often have I uh, painted a studio, or I, I, I almost never will I start a studio painting unless I already have good solid studies, usually two or three of that subject first anyway. So I don't need to take it back out. And how big do you paint in studio? What's the largest you'll do? Uh, well, eight feet by 10 feet. I've got a few of those out there. I don't do them often. Uh, big paintings take a special subject. You know, you can't just, unless you want to go more abstract, uh, it has to be a, uh, a subject that has weight and uh, volume to hold the canvas, that uh, the canvas can hold it. Can you give an in example a way what would have weighted volume? Are you talking about like a mountain or? Well, yes, uh, certainly a mountain wood or uh, uh, I just finished a, a painting for the gold medal show for the California Art Club that is a large painting. And it's uh, a large sandstone cliff with a, a wash that runs through the bottom of it and uh, far distant mountains. So all that is very dynamic. And I worked out two different uh, studies uh, studies to do it both on from location and then I combined the two to make it into the the composition that I wanted to be in the color range and typically will you put more detail in a studio painting than you will in a plein air painting no actually I try to put no more in I I do uh, I do find that keeping the canvas uh, prioritized is a super important thing uh, in a studio painting because while you're working on the bottom right corner, it's the most important thing in your mind. So I have, uh, that's why I have such a large studio. I, I make all my decisions from back about 10 to 12 feet from my painting. And then I walk forward and execute them. So it keeps me from micromanaging and putting too much detail in areas that don't need it. And then if, if I've made my focal area of the painting meaningful, uh, then the rest of the painting will has to be uh, subdued from that amount of detail or that amount of interest, uh, maybe color contrast or, or tonal contrast. So uh, I just make sure it balances out to where the focal area is important. 
You, you, uh, John, are one of the great teachers. Uh, a lot of people can be great painters, but it's tough to be a great painter and a great teacher. You have uh, this video that you did with us. Um, I oftentimes am referring people to it because I think it's one of the really great examples of where you can get a full plein air education where you, you're covering so much and, and so eloquently and easily that everybody kind of gets it. But when you're out teaching, and I know you do a lot of workshops and a lot of teaching, uh, what do you think are the things that you see the most often that people kind of get hung up on or maybe are uh, areas they're making mistakes that people can maybe try to overcome by listening to what you're saying here? Well, um, I think the biggest mistake most plein air painters make, if we're talking specifically about that, is they don't hone their skills in specific areas. So, for instance, tonal recognition is something I work really hard with my students on. Uh, I teach a uh, semester-based class out of my studio that we work only in the studio. And uh, I have exercises that I've developed over the years uh, that work really well to get them to recognize tone, tonal relationships better. And then I apply, so I do a step-by-step -step process. Once they're strong in the tonal relationships, then we apply color to that tone and say I limit the tone to three values. Uh, they have to sign color to those values before, they're, before they take them and place them on the canvas. What happens when we go outdoors is if we haven't practiced those and gained strength in those areas, um, you go outdoors and you just see way too much. Uh, things are out of control and, uh, and, they, and it looks like it. Uh, the palette management can become difficult outdoors because uh, it's smaller and the uh, tonal recognition gets completely out of control because there's so many different values out there. So grouping your shadows and grouping your lights becomes more difficult. So I find a combination and that's why I'm teaching now a combination of studio work to gain those strengths and outdoor recognition of how to apply them works really well in a teaching environment. I want to get some clarity on that because um, when you're talking tonal, are you really essentially talking about doing value studies in the beginning? I am, but uh, yeah, tone and value to me are, are basically interchangeable words. I haven't found enough difference in them, but yes, uh, the, if, if you don't group your values or your tones uh, in a way, the painting is made of that. Uh, if you look at Ansel Adams' work, black and white uh, suffices well to make an image. Uh, but if you, you can get, if you can't do that, if you can't make a great grouping of values in three or four values to say whatever you want to say, you can't paint with color. So, I, and I find many, many of my students are resistant to it in the beginning and say, well, I'm, I, I want to work with color. I want to just go straight to color. And uh, there's a great saying out there that, uh, you know, tone does all the work or value does all the work and color gets all the credit. And it's right. true. Yeah. If, you, if, you don't, if you don't pay attention to the values, you're, you're just not going get to get anywhere. What do you mean by grouping the values? I've never heard that term. Well, uh, say all your shadows, in, uh, your shadows I think of uh, in a painting as the bones of the painting. And if they're broken up and not interconnecting or relating to each other in some way, uh, you don't really have uh, a painting that holds together. If you look at any great painting and squint at it or uh, turn it into a black and white on your Photoshop, on your computer or something, you'll find that the values that are the darks are that they need to visually connect with each other. And I'm not saying they have to touch, but they, they point at each other. They, they run things into each other. And that's what holds the painting together really well. Plus you're deciding in your shadows, is the painting mostly shadow or mostly light? Nothing's 50-50 in a painting that looks good. It's gotta be uh, two thirds and a third or something like that. So uh, by, by deciding in advance where your shadows and where your lights are gonna be in simple value judgment, you build the painting in a way that's gonna hold up through the color work, through the larger canvas, and all the way into the final piece of art. Now, I, I also understand that uh, a lot of painters 
will make that same kind of a decision when it comes to um, not only light and shade, but warm and, and cool. I guess it's it's really the same thing. But when you're first looking at the scene and, and saying, okay, am, am I going to make this painting predominantly warm or predominantly cool? Is that essentially the same or are you looking at it differently? No, I'm looking at it differently. Uh, uh, shadow, uh, usually there's a lot less information in the shadow. Uh, and and most of the color and the bright comes into the light. Now that isn't, nothing's true 100% of the time in painting, but it, generally that's true. So outdoors, t shadows tend to be on the warm side. Again, there's no 100%. But uh, uh, light, light, of course, is then coming in on the cool side. Now we think of it as warm. I don't want to get too into the teaching side of this in this talk, but uh, even even a, uh, a sun, the sun comes down through a blue atmosphere and it makes a very cool light on the landscape. Sometimes we don't recognize that because there's uh, uh, orange bushes or something, uh, a warm looking bush, but the light influence is very cool. So it's hard to recognize that for a beginning painter. Um, so a shadow, it's about tonal relativity, not about temperature relativity. When I think of temperature relativity, it's keying the canvas to a warm or a warmer uh, hue, I guess you would say, uh, all the way through the whole painting. Still, the shadows come in a little bit uh, darker for sure. Uh, on the shadow side uh, of the tonal relativity and uh, the light comes in on the lighter side. So it's just a matter of where you key it. Talk to me about composition. Well, I, I'm a, a real stickler on uh, area of interest and uh, building a strong one. And uh, in composition, so known from the Renaissance, um, in the golden mean. And I actually have a lecture that I do. Uh, I travel around and do uh, about that. And the, uh, it needs to be less complicated than figuring out the golden mean, unless you're a trained artist, but most people going into the field need something a little simpler. So basically you stay out of the middle and head up towards one of the corners for a area of interest. And everything in that painting should be designed to serve that. That's the reason for the painting. So it's like setting a stage. You bring up the lighting in that area. You uh, bring all the lines to that area. And strangely enough, nature does that naturally for us. So I teach people to recognize that and see it and place it correctly on the canvas as the priority. And then everything else becomes a bit part player that uh, holds together the interest on the area of interest. So Oster used to say um, he had his... I think CW says the same thing. He had his star, his supporting cast, and, and so on. But he would he would make the uh, the sharpest edges, the brightest brights, the darkest darks, the uh, the most chroma in the point of interest, and then he would soften everything as he goes out. CW does the same thing. Are you doing something similar, or do you try to keep everything in focus? Well, no, I I think I. Uh... I, I am very aware of that priority and I certainly have made mistakes in paintings and I walk into a, a show and look at it and go, I sure wish I would have taken a little more <laughs> off that edge out there on the side. But yes, as, as if, if I'm painting the way I like to paint, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So some painters uh, like McGurl um, disagree with that philosophy. I think they, they agree with the idea of point of interest, but they're, their sense is that everything should be sharp and everything should be in focus. How do you feel about that? Well, thank God for different opinions. You yeah. know, we, yeah. there, there is no right or wrong in painting and, and Joe's, uh, Joe McGurl's work, uh, stands on its own. And, uh, uh, I, I just think that, uh, to get a different look, you have to have a different opinion and, and a different way of accomplishing that, opinion. So I, I, I love that artists all think so much different, but we're all still working with the same truth. And if you really look at Joe's work, he may not be trying to accomplish it, but he has very strong areas of interest. That boat sitting under the sun uh, that just won the ARC 
award. Oh yeah. Uh, that that glare out there is a very specific area of interest. Everything else is serving it. So I'm just. Um, uh, I guess I would say that nothing's incorrect, but. Uh, in my world of painting and the way I teach, I have to come up with some direction uh, to make my decisions based in my paintings and based for my students to learn. One thing I'm curious about is is there are a lot of people who are workshop, work, workshop junkies, and they will study under a number of different people and a number of different styles all within a same period of time. Um, is that a... Um, is there a right or wrong in that? Is it confusing? Does it is it make them? Does it help them expand, or does it create more problem? Uh, well, uh, conversation we just had about point of interest is, uh, or an area of interest is a good example of two different opinions. And Joe teaches, and I teach, say so. Uh, to go if he, if if you were in my class one week and the next week or next month you were in another class that espoused the opposite point of view, it would be rather confusing, I would think. Yeah. Be like uh, trying to learn mathematics, uh, uh, you know, w- with a calculator and with an abacus. It would be two different approaches to get the same answer. Uh, so I would think, and I've kind of proven to myself now. Uh, because of my semester-based classes where I'm training people over a longer period of time than just a five-day workshop, uh, they're, they're responding better. They're getting these exercises that they get a whole week to move through on a, on a constant thought. And they come back with stronger paintings at the end of exactly the same amount of hours um, as a five-day workshop. So uh, my students are repeating three, four years at a yeah, I've got some that have been with me four years now in this, and they're painting really well. Uh, so I think consistency message helps because they can make their own decisions. I just teach tools. I teach people to express themselves the way they want to with good, solid tools. Well, I think that's critical. I, uh, when I first started painting, I, I studied uh, weekly with two different people who were at the opposite end of the spectrum, and I think I became schizophrenic as a result the um, <laughs> the the thing that I have since decided is I'm going to stick with one instructor and keep repeating that one instructor. So if there's somebody that I'm going to study under, I want to go to that person's workshop when I can two or three times over the course of you know two or three years because I think it I think your your idea is right. <clears throat> I certainly am not against people going to a lot of workshops, but I. I think you know you need to figure out how to get really good at something and just keep working on that one thing until you really get it down. Yes, I, I you know one of the things that I have learned teaching for 15 years now is some people come to a workshop not really to learn how to paint but just to paint. And uh I used to get really frustrated with that because I couldn't get them to do anything that I was saying that would help them. And uh, I've realized that some people, everybody's got a different motive for being there. Some people uh, feel safer with a group. Some people uh, are just doing it as a hobby, never want to really get much better. And then some people are in there for the, you know, the blood and the guts of it. They want to get good really fast and, and uh, they're paying close attention. Yeah, that's, uh, so, that, that's anyway, there's a lot of different reasons. Yeah, well, and, and there's not a right or wrong in that for sure. I mean, I, I think that's fine. Right. Um, Frustrating. I've heard that from a lot of instructors over time that it's frustrating that they're not following the lessons. But hey, it's their money. They can do what they want. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. As long as it's not disrupting the class and people that want to follow the lesson. Uh, so, when they start seeing, that's one of the great things about the semester base. People see results out of the people that are following the exercises and doing them. And they go, whoa, maybe I'm going to try that. So because it's a longer period of time, 12 weeks, they do try it and they get results. So you got to have people come in, the people move into San Clemente to, uh, to study with you for 12 weeks? Well, shockingly, there's hardly anyone else doing this. And uh, uh, I have people from LA that drive, which you know what that traffic's like. Oh. Uh, San Diego County comes up and I've got Riverside from Temecula. I have three students that come in. And uh, I'm always surprised. One girl from L.A. comes down, uh, one lady, 
uh, and she rides her bicycle for the day so that she can come down and, uh, you know, beat the traffic. And then she spends the night in a hotel room and drives back up the next day. So she's quite dedicated. That is dedication. And getting good results. Oh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, I, we're, we're running low on time here. I want to ask you um, if you want to leave everybody with a couple of thoughts about painting, maybe something you've discovered that might be helpful to people. Uh, anything come to mind? Well, I think the, the method you were talking about of learning to paint is uh, the best. And that's find something that resonates with you, not just a painter you like their paintings, but find a teacher who can actually teach. It'll really help you get through because the message will be delivered to you in a way that uh, uh, gives you the tools to paint with rather than watching somebody paint that you're going, ooh, ah, and want to buy their demo. Uh, you know, you may want to do that. Every, I'll say you get a, a good painting, but um, uh, I just think that'll probably go further for your learning. That would be really tenacious. Tenacity is 99% of painting. I couldn't draw when I was a little boy, and I spent my life trying to do it and with varying success. But uh, drawing is something that you have to do if you're going to be a painter. A lot of people like to ignore it, but it shows. It's where your skirt really kind of hikes up uh, when you're further along in your painting. So, And it's very teachable. Everybody can learn to draw. Are you one of those guys so, that always has fun. a sketchbook in your pocket? No, not necessarily. But uh, I do sketch quite a bit. Uh, I, I, you know, Every day I sketch something. But I don't walk around with a sketchbook in my pocket because uh, I, I have other things I'm interested in also. And uh, even sketching all the time for me becomes distracting. I, I just like to look at things sometimes and absorb them rather than my eye sketches them. So, John, you briefly worked in the White House. Uh, tell me briefly about that. Well, I got lucky when I was young and went in the military uh, right after Vietnam and uh, was chosen for service at the White House. So I landed right in the middle of Watergate. Uh, with President Nixon, and I got to travel uh, quite extensively around the world and see great art collections and meet really interesting people. And uh, uh, I'd never left California really before that, so it opened my eyes to the world. And I've never really been able to stop traveling since. And, and so, you were uh, that, you were you were around some pretty incredible people. Did anybody give you any any great advice, or did you see? something that really helped you uh, in your art career? Yes, uh, a few few people really opened my eyes to the way I wanted to live my life more than anything. Mm. Uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, Secretary Kissinger told me at one point, he kind of came up and was sitting next to me, I think on a flight over to Europe. And uh, he said, uh, uh, you know, fight, what are you going to do with your life? And uh, I said, well, I'm not sure yet. I I'm just here and doing what I'm doing. And he said, well, you know, my advice to you is, it, this is in a nutshell, of course, is uh, find something that you really, really love and hold on to it and do it with all your heart and it'll show and you'll be successful at it. That's what I've done with my art career. And it so happened that uh, I was, my specialty was the Eastern Bloc countries. So I spent quite a bit of time in, like, France, uh, Ceausescu's Romania. And uh, I woke up one morning where they put me on a little narrow-gauge train through the Alps, and I woke up in a bedroom that was just full of art from uh, that probably that the Nazis had taken. But uh, there were Monet's and, I mean, everything was in this bedroom that I was in. And uh, this is the first time I'd really been exposed to that. And uh, I thought, I could do this if I if I worked on it. So <laughs> it, that came back to me many times after that, that, that waking up in that room to those paintings. Outstanding. Well, John, how can people learn more about your workshops or find more information about you? Well, uh, if they go to uh, cosbystudio.com, uh, that's my website. And uh, of course, you know, friend me on Instagram or Facebook or follow me or whatever. And, uh, uh, I'm actually doing a, a lecture series that's going to be a little podcast on color, on design, uh, composition, 
things like that, but just little five minute to 10 minute snippets of information that I teach that I'm going to offer out to the world. And uh, it's being compiled right now. So you can learn quite a bit about painting through those. Outstanding. Well, John, thank you so much. And uh, it's it's been a pleasure knowing you over the years and you've influenced me a lot and, and taught me so much. And I just want to acknowledge you for the great things that you've done for all of us. Thank you for that. Well, thanks, Eric. I appreciate you calling me and uh, having this talk. Well, thanks again to John Cosby. John is one of the truly great guys, one of the nicest guys in the world, and uh, what a great painter. We did a video with him, oh, I don't know, a couple years ago now, I guess maybe a little longer, and it's kind of the one when somebody says, well, I want to learn plein air painting, and, you know, what's got the most comprehensive stuff? Well, we've got a lot of great stuff, but the John Cosby video just really kind of covers it all. You can get that at streamlineartvideo.com. Today's podcast was sponsored by the Plen Air Convention in Santa Fe. Um, you want to get there, it's plenairconvention.com and also the Publishers Invitational in the Adirondack Mountains. Just go to publishersinvitational.com. And also, if you've not seen my new blog where I kind of talk about life and art and all kinds of things like that, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee. You can find it at coffeewitheric.com. Well, the plein air movement is red hot, which is why plein air magazine remains the leader. Top representational art magazine sold in America at Barnes & Noble. Thank you very much for making that happen. Drop by, pick one up if you don't have it, or get a subscription for about half the price of what you pay on the newsstand at pleinairmagazine.com. This is always fun for me. I love doing this. I guess I'm an old radio hack. What can I tell you? Let's do it again sometime, like next week. We'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and the founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a great big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.